I was going to ask you a couple of couple of questions maybe before the others come back, but um, the on Fire for Planet A, there was reason that uh, there was a little bit about the uh, was that the one in Victoria with the two the two they had the two wind turbines. Yeah, Gusto and Gale. That's um the Hepburn Wind yes. Community um, Wind um, Project. Yeah, so I think it um which which makes it good because you've sort of like it for those people that have have watched that that uh, doco on ABC then it gives um, an idea of what that what those community projects can look like um so so about how many about how many community projects are up and running do you know of it in australia mm. Yeah, well, about 10 years ago, there was only a handful and they've really um, taken off in the, in the last decade. And it's the point where there's now, uh, I think at the last count, there was over 110 groups operating with um, around 150 projects. So some groups have more than one project. So, yeah, we're really starting to take off. Yeah, well, that, that, that number surprises me, but I suppose that's sometimes the problem with things like this is that we don't, um, it doesn't achieve, it doesn't get the publicity or the, the the coverage that it should mm. yeah. yeah that's something that we're trying to change at community power agency we're hoping yeah. to um do a lot more storytelling and um getting media to really show what's possible in terms of yeah. community energy well somebody said they like the they like the acronym core so that's uh that's a good that's a, that's a good start Great. <laughs> so maybe i'll just get everybody else to come back in so we um can just ask questions of people as they drop in. I have a burning question just to- Oh, Dee's got a burning question. But then we wanna, we definitely one for everyone, but um, I'm just curious in the last decade, uh, can you kind of think about some of the key drivers that meant that there was that flourishing of projects? Were there, was there kind of, I, I guess, a barrier that was removed or some momentum that was gained from you know a, a chain of events often is the case but yeah I mean I think why? there's a few um I think one of one of the probably top one is that you know the first couple of projects just had to get up and running so that people could see that it's possible and then those groups um were able to share their knowledge um also, another thing that happened in the last 10 years is that um, Community Power Agency was formed and um, a lot <laughs> of our work is, is focused on capacity building and advice and, and really going out to communities to take, take them through how you can start these projects. So um, I'd like to say that we've had quite a hand in, in um, enabling that, um, but also through doing advocacy and convincing governments that this is community energy is a really great way to do regional um, kind of engagement, regional growth um, to enable communities to um, take better charge of their own energy. And so a lot of the work of the advocacy work that we've done has, has enabled, um, I guess, especially state level support, particularly in Victoria, but also in New South Wales, there's grant programs that have come out in the last five years that have really enabled lots of um, projects to get off the ground because we we know there's lots of passion and commitment and and time that um, community volunteers are willing to put to these projects. But there comes a point when they really do need funding to seek um, kind of expert advice to take to the next level or to get feasibility studies done to to show that yes, this project is viable for then community to invest in it um, more readily. People like Matthew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, actually, speaking of good, good segue, D. Um, Matthew. So, you, you talked like obviously very much at the, I suppose, the macro level of investing, and there's certainly been um, some very positive articles in the, like, in the paper recently about big fund managers um, wanting to take on particularly fossil fuel companies about their. Um, their so-called credibility, I suppose, when they're you know talking about doing carbon capture and all these sort of things, and that's not happening. Is is there a a, a, a micro list for for people like us who who might want to uh, you know the the local share investor at home, the 
in any other way we can invest green with our yeah. own money. Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, it's growing. Uh, the the interest in the sector has grown significantly in the last. Um, I don't think I've seen it grow more in the, so that in the last twelve months. Um, you know, there's been a real interest in this sector. And I think you're seeing that by uh, the demand for people in a number of different superannuation funds that offer ethical and ESG investments. Um, but, but, you know, but what, what can you do? I mean, you can engage. Um, you can encourage your, your managers to engage with these big organisations. You can vote. You know, you can, you, if you're a shareholder and you, 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 you own those shares, you can vote. And, you know, you have a voice there. You have a voice for change. And, and it's becoming even more aware at, at a board level because, you know, the regulatory change that we're seeing offshore is making trustees and directors of, of trustees be aware of their fiduciary duty. And fiduciary duty is to manage all risk. And, and climate change is a massive risk. Mm -hmm. So I think they're, they're the sort of key things that, that we're starting to see emerge. So it's really having that voice. And if you, if, if you know, if you've got the capacity to vote, yeah, you should vote. You should be talking to your financial advisor about how you want to, you know, you want your funds allocated. Uh, you should be talking to your fund managers like we do. We, we're, we're constantly in contact with them about, you know, having conversations with, with those companies. Um, so it's about being proactive and it's, but it's about being positive because it's, it's, um, it, it is about a change. It's about a transition. Um, and it doesn't happen straight away. We, we, we understand that, but we've got to try and help that along in some way. Um, and if we can push that a little bit harder and a little bit faster and by allocating capital to it, we'll, we'll, we'll try and do that. Yeah. yeah it's, actually, it's interesting that the, the uh, shareholder voting thing, like uh, you often click on a, an Avaaz or a change.org or like a sign a petition. And one of the questions, one of the last, are you a shareholder? And definitely that makes a difference if you are a, a shareholder of um, one of those companies that are being petitioned for change. Um, Peter, there was a question to you, Peter, about um, how, and I might have missed it, but how many bikes, how many bikes of um, the bike shed put out on the road? So that we, maybe we can we can get a carbon calculator out and work out how much how much you might have saved than, than I our, can, our emissions. I can give you rough statistics for last year. We processed about four hundred bikes. About 200 went back out onto the road. So we recycled probably 200, at roughly one and a half ton of steel. Wow, that's many, very impressive. <laughs> at nine cents a, a kilo, it way. doesn't buy too many coffees. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd love to do it. Uh, anybody watching, if they, you know, mathematically inclined, we can work out maybe 200 bikes at so many kilometres um, versus uh, versus cars. How much how much we might have saved that way? That would be good. The other thing that no one really knows, unless they're in South Australia, is where Belair is and what, the hills, are, what the hills are like. I was thinking that. <laughs> yeah, I, think... I, I studied at Flinders Uni. I definitely know that oh, hill you very well. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, my, my sister. Years. I think my sister lives about uh, half a kilometre from the Blackwood United Church, so I know that area as well. Uh, well, I'm actually in Hawthorne Dean. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Alice, um, I suppose it's the same. Like the the, and you've you're trying to create a, a view with your overturn the tables about um, how people can do. Um, do things themselves, but I can I ask a question? Like, so when you first started, you know, out of ten, what was the degree of difficulty in 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 doing what you did? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing forty things in forty days. That's for sure. It was hard. It was possibly the hardest thing I think I've ever done. Um, and there was tears, and there was stress, and there was frustration. And there was maggots in my compost, and everything. Like it was just, it was a mess. Uh, but coming out of that I think it was it was like I was renewed and I think that whole process of Lent that that idea of needing to take the time to sacrifice is so important and I think that um, that's something that's always missing in the conversation about you know when we're transitioning we actually need to mentally um, and emotionally allocate that time to process the change that's going that we're going through and what we're trying to do and and the way that things are happening, because 
ultimately like all the all the surface things like in my house like things work completely differently um and my poor husband had to come along that journey with me in terms of what we do differently and lots of stuff but that's all very physical and, and lots of things but mentally and in my in my heart and, and all that sort of stuff that was where the change was and that took a lot I often think of it I often liken it to being like a diet um you know, it, a lot of people go on, you know, diets and those sorts of things. But unless unless you change the culture and the thinking um, around what's going on, like you often don't see those changes within yourself. Um, and that's why, you know, lots of people diet and then, and then don't fail and all that stuff. And there's tons of psychology around that. Um, but, yeah, that I think we need to do that for, you know, for a person that wants to start the journey. You have to start small. You can't just go with these big, um, ambitious ideas and say oh yeah we're going to do this because even for me like the the goal was to get rid of my rubbish bin but I had to take at least 40 steps to get there and I've soon realized that those 40 steps weren't weren't near enough um, for me to get there by the end of Lent I was not zero waste I'm still not zero waste like that zero waste is still just the goal um, but it's you know it's it's working towards it all the time uh, so yeah yeah Probably be at zero race before Australia ever gets to zero net emissions because we, because <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 twenty fifty at best um, according no. to. Uh, Can I ask, um, ask a question? Yes. Is your husband as passionate about us as you are? He uh, he thought I was going through a phase um, <laughs> when we started. <laughs> he was yeah, like, "Oh, yeah. at the end of Lent, we'll go back to normal," and I was like, "No, no, 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 that's not going to happen." Uh, but he. Um, he's very much he's on the journey with me like he doesn't do things um with the same instinct that I do uh like when I see stuff I you know I see things in a completely different way he's sort of not really at that level um but even this week he sort of turned around to me he's a um avid board game collector he's, he loves his board games we play board games constantly and um he's recently figured out that you can buy them secondhand and they're normally in okay condition he's so he's gone and bought about style. Yeah, but they yeah. So he's gone and bought about five this week or something, <laughs> just because he he figured out that he could. So you know he yeah he does um sort of change it. And like even the other day, I said to him because we spent six months apart after we got married at the end of last year, um when we were moving house. And unfortunately, he sort of reverted back to a few things. Like he went and bought shampoo, um not. A shampoo bar like I normally do or using bicarbonate vinegar and stuff like that he just bought normal shampoo and I said to him okay well now that we've gotten to the end of the really big bottle that we've bought can we start now um you know trying this this new thing and he's like yeah okay just show me how to do it and I'll give it a go so he's always open to it and I am very thankful that he is um like that but there are some things he won't compromise on so and that's okay like we're baby steps together. I must, I must admit, Alice, um, I've actually worked many years in waste management, but when I first saw <laughs> top of your list that you removed chocolate, I was like, wow, that's like <laughs> passionate and dedicated. I don't well, know if I could go that far. I don't, I, I still eat chocolate, but just not, um, not the single use ones. Like oh yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. But, but I'm grateful for that because I had a visualization of the bulk chocolate in my food co-op. So yeah. I will start to get off the Whitaker's coconut chocolate yeah yeah although I have heard I really wish um Daryl Lee's gone fed like gone um no palm oil which is fantastic that's so exciting um mm -hmm. but they're still wrapped in plastic so I'm really torn because they have some of the best quality chocolate now um because they're not using the palm oil and all that sort of stuff but uh yeah but I still can't bring myself to buy it mm -hmm. so actually check out um be slavery free yes it, that stuff's great they've yeah. been campaigning against Cadbury's for a while yeah, yeah. thoroughly yeah. sorry and that that's that's the important part of is it you know like we've got to be proactive in the approach and try and help those companies transition so that you know they're meeting the consumer's needs um mm. so that's 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 really important it's, it's great to see that you're transitioning it's a transition for you Alice isn't it you know you're transitioning over a period of time and your family yeah. as well so yeah that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, you know, help, uh, you know, encourage companies to transition, you know, particularly to a low carbon economy. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's, and it can't, I don't, you know, it's hard to do it just straight away, but mm -hmm. if we can, you know, we can just continue 
at it, you know, and it's happening, you know, and I think as Christy said, it's becoming a cheap, cheaper, it's becoming cheaper for renewables. So it makes sense, not only from a fiduciary perspective, but also from, you know, a financial perspective as well. I saw an article today saying that um, super funds who are the most ethical actually mm. have the highest mm-hmm. returns. Mm. Um, and yeah. I, I say that's a large response. That's a, largely because of all of the climate impacts that many organizations are now having to pay for that's right. um, or becoming yeah. more expensive to extract from whichever fossil fuel they're using is adding up. And yeah. whereas renewable energy is a really cheap form of producing energy. And if our super funds are investing in those, then we're seeing the returns. <laughs> so it's yeah, great. Well, there's potentially have stranded assets, valuations on those companies become exactly. worth, cost of capital becomes higher, you know, so there's all these things that are starting to compound and impact those organizations. So yeah, it's 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 happening and it's it's um and it's it's at a it's at a good reasonable pace, but it's starting to really pick up. And I, you know, I think over the next six to twelve to eighteen months we're gonna see it even grow even faster. So mm. gotta keep keep pushing it along. Yes, and so I was thinking, uh, Christy, that uh, when you were talking about um, and Dee made a comment <laughs> uh, in Facebook about uh, turning your uh, in, into a uh, tourist attraction. So I was, I've been mentally trying to think ever since then about how I can make my uh, solar panels on my roof into a into a local tourist attraction. <laughs> in, uh, but um, and uh, and it is that. Um, Sadly, we've ha- we have those um, comments from people like uh, Joe Hockey when he was talking about the wind farms as you the, the as you head into Canberra, where I've always seen them mm-hmm. as being uh, like you know a, a great thing on the yeah, a great thing hope. to see on the horizon because on the you know because they represent something that you know that kind of a real change to our environment mm-hmm. rather than going backwards. I'd much rather mm-hmm. see. Uh, wind turbines on the horizon than a coal-fired power station for it, or a or an Adani coal mine, for example. So cleaner think, air. <laughs> yes. Have, have you seen the kind of I get some some of the conversation around um, wind turbine developments change? Because I certainly remember Joe Hockey's comment, and I remember that was always the, the, the there was a, a lot of the media about community energy or renewable particularly wind turbines was always Mm. greeted with a lot of community conflict and that was the image of like the classic community response was not in my backyard that has the I guess the attitudes towards wind power been changing yeah so I'll, I'll just make a quick distinction that um not all wind farms are community energy a lot of them are large scale renewable energy projects um they become community energy if they're community owned or if the community benefits in some way. Um, so I'll just make that distinction. Um, there has been a lot of changes and largely I think that's because the um, wind industry just went in with a similar approach to the way the fossil fuel developments happen saying, we've got this technology, we want to put it here and we're just going to do it. <laughs> um, and they quickly learned that that wasn't gonna be um, all good with the local community. And so then um, started to do much better community engagement. And we would say that that any development, regardless of whether it's renewable energy or not, needs to have a really great community engagement strategy to go along with it, to make sure that um, whatever it is, is placed in an appropriate way, that the community is brought along the journey of, of what's happening in their area um because a lot of the um like the conflict initially was people saying oh, i've got um wind turbine syndrome it's giving me headaches all this sort of stuff uh, and while a lot of that has been scientifically unproven what is um has been proven is that people can develop symptoms from the stress of of some development or something happening in their place that they don't understand or are worried about and so people can get sick from stress as from, you know, being stressed from work, it's similar to being stressed about what's going to happen to, you know, something that you care about. Um, but we have found when community engagement is done well and, and people are taken along the journey and are involved and have, I guess, agency in saying, well, 
I'm not against renewable energy, but like there's a creek that goes through there and that's going to be too close to it. If you put it over there, it'd be much better. And if they can have a say in, in how it's done, then there's much less resistance. Um, yeah. That's, um, I suppose, that's the thing about the whole, this whole um, living, living the change that we need to, we, we need to live it and we can only live it by not, by not resisting it. Um, what, whatever, um, whatever we want to do in this space of, of climate action as well, isn't it? So whether it's big projects, whether it's, um, whether it's making sure you've got your keep cup with you all the time, um, trying to avoid buying, you know, all those things with plastic, um, riding your bike, investing ethically. Um, the, these are all parts that, and I think, you know, the, the premise around this whole event was to let people realize that it's not something that's big, that's not doable, but these are all things mm -hmm. that, you know, climate action is something that can be done by everybody. And, and in climate week, um, which we're in and with the, um, the student yeah, strike yeah. on um, oh, yeah. lots of actions occurring on Friday. I think there's now heading towards 300 actions in Australia on Friday with that. So, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a lot of a big groundswell now of community um, behind this, I think. So um, this is, for me, this is just another part of that. So I'm really grateful for everybody being involved tonight. Um, if we get questions that are, are, that keep on coming in um, later, um, which sometimes they're, I'll just pass them on to everybody. Um, everybody, I just see Christy sent me the link to Haystacks, which I'll put on uh, Facebook and I'll slip into the comments. But yeah, no, it, it's great. Um, it's really, it's really good to have you all um, as part of this evening. Um, and. I wish you all well in your climate actions in the future. And, uh, and thank you very much for participating in Hipping Uniting's Neighbourhood Night this evening. I wish you, I wish you well in, but uh, like Dee, Alice, I'm probably a bit doubtful about the chocolate. That's, I'm just gonna leave that out there as, I, as we leave this evening. But, um, transition, Andrew, yeah. I really love okay, that, transition. that image. Transition. Thanks, Matt. Okay, yeah. thank, you thank, you thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you so much.